Hello, and welcome to Road to Relay. In Road to Relay, we will take a few steps along some survivors and their families as they navigate the cancer experience. No two people will have the same experience, but along the way you'll find compassion, community, help, and most of all, hope. In the first episode, we met Marilyn, an ovarian cancer survivor who inspired us. Last week, we met Gail, a caregiver who illustrated that while there are struggles in the journey, there are also rewards. We heard Gail talk about how even seemingly small things during treatment can make a big difference, such as how a port bandage is applied. So today, I have the honor of talking with the most senior executives in two agencies that will make the most difference from small to large in your cancer experience here in Saskatchewan. Scott Livingstone of the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency and Keith Carrison of the Canadian Cancer Society spend their entire professional lives focused on improving the experience for patients and family with the ultimate goal of prevention and eradication of cancer as a whole. Let's hear from them now. So Scott, tell me about your organization and your role in it. Okay. So I work with the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency and we are the provincial organization that provides health care services to patients who are diagnosed with cancer in the province. And what that means is we have two primary clinics in Saskatoon and Regina that will provide the mainstay of cancer treatment for patients who have been diagnosed through their family physician or specialist. Beyond cancer care, which would include chemotherapy and radiation therapy, we also provide psychosocial support for our patients, screening, nutrition services, and a number of other uh, programs within the organization, like the screening programs for uh, cancer. We run three screening programs in the province, the program that screens patients for breast cancer, cervical cancer, and our latest screening program, which is colorectal cancer screening program. We also run prevention programs for the province and try to educate patients and their families on cancer prevention strategies to stay healthy. 50% of all cancers are preventable, so that's a, a mainstay in what we do. And finally, we operate uh, two cancer patient lodges, one in Saskatoon and one in Regina, across from the centers that allow patients to come into Saskatoon and Regina while they're receiving treatment and stay in a hotel-like service while they're in the, 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 the cities for cancer treatment. My role is as the Chief Executive Officer to provide direction to the organization with respect to our strategic priorities, uh, which are uh, improving cancer patient access, uh, making sure the cancer patient and their family is at the center of our decision making and improving patient experience, ensuring that our services are of high quality and safe, and last but not least, uh, making sure that the services are sustainable. And when we talk about sustainability in cancer care, we're really talking about prevention and screening, ensuring that we're finding cancers at the very earliest stage and also preventing people from having cancer because the only way to make cancer care sustainable is to prevent people from actually getting it. Keith, can you tell us about your organization and your role? Sure. Uh, I'm with the Canadian Cancer Society and we're a national organization and I'm with the Saskatchewan Division of that organization. And we're a volunteer-led charitable organization whose mission is to raise funds through fundraising to uh, fund world-class research and then provide support for people living with cancer uh, across and, and, and dealing with issues around prevention, advocacy, uh, information and support as well. Okay, and the Saskatchewan division is different from other divisions, how? Well, we're one organization, but we have uh, through how the organizations run, each province is led by a group of volunteers uh, who hire staff to carry out the mission of the organization. There are several key things that the organization tries to achieve nationally, certain core programs and activities, and then the organization really at each provincial level is left to, to go into more detail and provide more services than, than potentially other provinces. In Saskatchewan, uh, of course, we, we raise public funds to fund world-class research through uh, the Canadian Cancer Study Research Institute, but beyond that, then it's about providing services and and advocating for healthy public policy and working with our partners at the cancer agency to make sure that cancer patients, their caregivers, are supported throughout the continuum of the cancer experience from, from, from screening and prevention in terms of those messages about preventing cancer and detecting it early right through to supporting people with their cancer experience and beyond. Scott, I always think of SCA as being medical where the Canadian Cancer Society is more support. Can you talk about the partnership? 
No, I, I wouldn't say that you're mistaken in the assumption. I, I would expand a little bit on our, our mandate in that the agency also has a, as a, as a role in prevention and, and screening. But with respect to our, our partnership, and I would say that cancer care in the province of Saskatchewan is only delivered through partnership. And although we are an organization that provides a large component of cancer treatment, we only do that to the success of our partnerships and our relationships with both regional health authorities and like-minded organizations like the Canadian Cancer Society. And we have a number of areas where we have partnered with the Canadian Cancer Society Saskatchewan Division on behalf of our patients to not just improve access to information, but also care and support. Um, we have similar mandates in that we're, we're driven to eradicate cancer from the, from the face of the earth, in, 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 for lack of a better way of putting it. But uh, some examples of our partnership would include um, the Canadian Cancer Society has a very, uh, well, a national information service for cancer patients located right here in Regina in our home province. And, and our organization has taken advantage of that by putting a cancer information specialist right in the Allen Blair Cancer Center here in Regina. We started as a, as a pilot project, but we've received um, just raving support from our patients and their families. And it's been a, a huge success uh, demonstrating our partnership as well as our commitment to improving patient experience through the cancer patient's journey. So we'll hope to expand that service in Saskatoon, but continue to work on other areas, uh, joint work and partnership and coalitions like educating folks on sun safety and being sun smart, working towards improving information and access to prevention and screening programs. We do uh, also uh, have a history of partnership through the Cancer Patient Lodges, which were donated to the agency years ago and, and now are operated by the Cancer Agency, but still supported through CCS, through volunteer drivers and other support that help our patients get back and forth to the clinic. Scott made an interesting point about the Cancer Lodge. Keith, do you want to talk about your partnership and how that came about? Right, uh, yeah, the organization really has, has looked at the cancer experience and and you know, doing things like building the lodges, we know that people need a place to stay when they travel in front of town. So, looking at the practical level, doing that, you know, through the financial assistance program, you know, the lodges were there. But then, how do people get into Regina or Saskatoon for treatment? And you know, a lot of people have difficult, difficult times financially during the cancer experience. So, helping people with access through the transportation, and, and then helping with a lodge stay, or if you're in Regina and Saskatoon. You know, and you have no way to get to treatment, having a volunteer pick you up or pick you up at the bus depot if you're from out of town to get to the treatment centers. All those kind of practical things that the organization has done really comes from a base that the organization at its foundation came from people who were health professionals and members of the community at large just saying we need to do something to inform people about cancer and to do something to support people with the experience. So the organization's mandate has been about, you know, funding world class research. But then again, at the ground level in the community, remembering that we're trying to help people with cancer who are our neighbors, our family members, our friends. So it's, it's a very personal thing. And I think you see the programs, be it you know, the range of support programs to help people living with cancer, right through the world-class information and the efforts to advocate for healthy public policy, uh, you know, right through to, to our range of other services are all about helping people in our communities with their cancer experience and, and, and support that. Well, Keith, I always think of the Canadian Cancer Society as being able to bring the community together to support people. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know, 10,000 volunteers in the province are volunteer to support the organization. Um, volunteer boards and unit committees across the province, you know, move to, drive to a point of having provincial leaders. So our division board are all volunteers uh, who come with, with their own stories. They're there, there's a motivation to be there to provide the volunteer leadership of the organization, but it really, it's a community response to, to the disease, which has, again, has its roots in Saskatchewan 75 years ago, uh, and really continues to drive the organization in terms of thinking at a practical level, what do we need to be doing to help people? What, what are these things that, that really, on, on the continuum of, of you know, diagnosis through care and, 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 and post-treatment, where do we have a role in supporting our colleagues in treatment? You know, we're, we're not healthcare, we know we're not healthcare, you know, we can pr produce really good quality health information and knowledge about cancer to share with people, but, you know, where did the, the volunteer trained lay people have a place to support people through that experience? And that's where we really are proud of how we're able to kind of work on that continuum with the folks in treatment to make sure that we're supporting each other and making sure that the patients are supported. 
Well, Scott, in, in what ways are you responding to patients and their families? So we have, um, over the last couple of years, post the patient first review, tried to change the, the face of the organization in trying to put patients and families at the center of our decision making. So some examples of that would be we, we have created a provincial family and patient advisory council for the organization, which has representation from many different aspects of patients and their families. We have patients with very relevant ca cancer experience, also patients who have family members, as well as members on our senior team at the same table. And wh why this is important is we found that as the Patient and Family Advisory Council sets a, a work plan for our organization to help us become more patient and family focused, it's important for us to have the right people at the table so that we can make those little decisions at the time we're at the discussion instead of having to wait to make changes to the organization. And these can be simple things. As an example, one of the first things our Patient and Family Advisory Council asked us to do is provide wireless internet access in the waiting areas of the cancer centers, which, which was something we did right away. It's not a hard change. And in many aspects, what we're looking at is helping get advice from that group, as well as our partners. Keith and the Canadian Cancer Society are represented on that committee as well, as, of, as they are on many of our other partnerships. Uh, to help advise us as an organization to how to improve that experience. One of the other things that I, our board has tried to do over the last couple of years to, to bring themselves down to, uh, to the reality of what's happening in the lives of our patients is having a patient story at each and every one of our board meetings. So we start uh, the Cancer Agency board meetings with a patient story. And that can be a good story or it can be a story that, that represents a number of challenges uh, for us as an organization. And why that's important is because not only do we invite them to the board and listen to them, but we'd, we follow up. And inevitably, we find out things, in, and in many cases, they're things that we don't control directly as an organization, but through working with our partners, we can make changes to how we provide care or services or, or things that, the little things like getting transportation to care or getting support for, for child care when a patient needs to come into treatment and, and understanding the realization of what it means to be in rural Saskatchewan and having to travel into a cancer center hundreds, literally hundreds of times over a multiple year cancer journey. And it's one of the other reasons why we're, we're focused on bringing treatment closer to home, both through the advice of our Patient and Family Advisory Council, but through the creation of 16 community oncology programs outside of Saskatoon and Regina, which deliver a large proportion of our treatments closer to home. Each and every board meeting, like I said, starts with a story. We, uh, we do follow up with our patients and our board, and we report back to the board annually on what we've done with that information, so it's not just listening to the story. And I think many of the things Keith talked about, um, that particularly one of the things that's come as a, with, even with the good stories, uh, a universal message from our patients is the financial burden um, that, that cancer poses to families, particularly young families that require multiple trips in, taking time off work. And I think, you know, one of the strengths of our partnership is, is actually not just mobilizing each other's organizations, but all the other community organizations that are out there that can help support our patients through these, uh, the, these journeys because it, it is a tremendous amount of pressure over and above the, the pressure that a disease uh, like cancer can, can and cause in a family, uh, family union. And it doesn't just touch the patient. It touches every single person around them. Keith, I think a lot of people don't understand that there really can be a financial burden associated with it. Can you talk about that a little? You know, I mean, we can be there to inform people and support them in terms of, of you know, the cancer experience, but the practicality of having to get there and, and cope with the financial burden, I mean, we talk about our program being financial assistance. We can't, you know, we can't help people with everything. What we can do is try to make it as easy as possible to help them to get to the treatment and stay there and, and, to, and to benefit from our services. So it's it's really about trying to provide just the kind of bare essentials for people who qualify to help them get to that experience. Because when somebody's diagnosed, people, not everybody has benefits that will, that will cover them completely in terms of lost income. There's lots of people that fall through the cracks. There's lots of people who are on fixed incomes in retirement that just don't have the flexibility to kind of accommodate the kinds of financial challenges that come with traveling weekly, if not daily sometimes, to come in for, for treatment. Uh, and so the society just tries to do what it, what it can. I think last year we spent probably about a quarter million dollars just on those people who, you know, who are probably at, at the threat threshold and needed the most extreme help in helping them get to treatment and stay at the lodges. And, and, and we know that's, that's just scratching the surface. Right. 
No, Scott, uh, going back to the lodges, uh, I know actually my mom stayed in the Cancer Lodge when I was in the Pasqua, um, and it was extremely affordable. How does that program work, do you know? I do. So uh, so the lodges, as I said before, there's two. There's one in South and one in Regina, and they are operated by the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency. We, we have funding in place operationally to support the lodges. We do try to, we do charge a fee for the lodge services, but the services includes the, the three square meals and snacks and a place where somebody can have as much as we, we try to have a home away from home for cancer patients. And, 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 and what we do is we also, because the services are actually at capacity sometimes, and we also have agreements with local hotels and, and we try to make patients whole. And what I mean by that is they wouldn't be charged more by that hotel or for meals than we, they would if they were actually uh, able to stay in the lodge. We, we have owned and operated them for a number of years. We do receive some donations that go into making improvements in the lodge, and we've just actually renovated the, the lodge in, in Regina, re redone some interior stuff. And we're looking at re actually replacing our lodge in Saskatoon. The lodge in Saskatoon, the building itself is 100 years old. And so we're looking right now at what our opportunities are to take the next step and create a new lodge in Saskatoon that's a state-of-art facility for folks to come and stay while they're in the city. So just to expand on that, one of the most important things about the lodge is, is, is again, one of our partnerships is, uh, and, and our volunteers as well. So we also share volunteers, I think. I just was uh, very lucky to speak to the volunteers at the Ellen Flair Cancer Centre at their annual uh, awards luncheon last week. And it was uh, impressive to see a lot of familiar faces that we see also through the CCS, but also talk about and hear them talk about how much time people spend at the lodge you know, you know, entertaining folks at night. We have um, folks who own uh, uh, what's the word for it? Um, the Soma Aesthetics folks right, that come yes, in and help yeah. people with makeup and hair. Um, you know, so if you're you're looking good, you're feeling good. So there's there's a variety of volunteer services that also go in to provide care for patients at the lodge. Uh, besides the drivers, besides you know, the entertainment, but also making sure that people don't feel alone uh, at night when they're, w if they don't want to be. Uh, it creates more of a community environment of support for folks when they're away from home as well. And, and CCS and the, the folks at Canadian Cancer Society and their volunteers are a, a critical component to that, besides the staff that work for the agency and, and manage the, 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 the lodge every day, the, the food services folks and the lodge management. So, Scott, what would you want uh, a person who hasn't gone through this cancer experience to know? What would you want them to take away from today? Well, I think, you know, to our, the conversations we've already had around the type of services and the partnerships that are available, and I think Keith spoke to this, is that, you know, the, the diagnosis of cancer, even though cancer has been a disease that's been with us since time itself, is still a word that scares people and, and families and, and, and I think the, the message that I want to leave is that the, the care community, which is all about partnerships, is really a community and there's lots of resources out there for folks. We, we try at our organization to try to provide as much information as we possibly can in a very quick and short period of time at the front end of treatment, but we also try on an ongoing basis to follow up with patients and measure what we call their distress. It's really the sixth vital sign of a patient and ensure throughout their journey with us that we're on an ongoing and proactive basis seeing what a patient has experienced and asking if they need help or resources. Typically, many patients don't access those services right off the start. It's, it's one of our, I think, a Saskatchewan, I sort of, we, we're, we're tough and we're internal with some of the things that go on, but eventually people open up and I think they see the, this is this is not this is not a journey they have to take alone, and there's lots of support out there from a variety of different sources. Mm -hmm. It's okay to ask the the hard questions, and it's okay to ask those questions that you might not think are always the easiest ones to ask, because that's what people are there for. They're really there to care for the person, and I think one of the strengths of our two organizations is that a, the one the one common thing I can tell you without a doubt, besides the fact that there's cancer in both of our names as organizations, is that. Our focus is on the patient and their families. And, and as we as organizations move forward, we always keep that at the front. And, the, and if you always keep that at the front of your decision making, um, you're never going to make the wrong decisions. Keith, 
Um, what would you like someone to take away about the Canadian Cancer Society? What, what do you want them to know? I think probably that, you know, you're going to get great treatment and care uh, that the agency and its incredible staff will provide and that the Canadian Cancer Study is going to be there alongside them in that experience to support the aesthetic through that experience in terms of what they need. Uh, and again, the society is there to contact us at, at the Cancer Information Service, contact our local offices throughout the province, and they will connect you with the supports and services that you need. So I think really it's about that, that there's going to be a strong continuum of care to really be there to help people with all of their needs, great treatment through the agency, and all the support and information services that the, the, that the volunteer part of, of this partnership can provide. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us today. It was very enlightening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Courtney Mackay. She's a registered dietitian at the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency, and she's going to give us some tips for maintaining really good nutrition throughout the treatment process. Hi, and welcome back. I'm here again with Courtney Mackay, and we're going to talk about treatment-friendly uh, foods and eating while you're in treatment. So, Courtney, what are you going to tell us about that? So our focus shifts a little from the prevention side of things. When people are going through treatment, um, our main goals are to maintain nutrition status and, and maintain a healthy weight at a time when many people find it difficult to do so. They don't have a great appetite, foods may taste bad, right. um, they may have a dry mouth or have mouth sores. So we really want to come up with some tips and, and tools to try and help them meet their nutritional needs. Um, For instance, yes. <laughs> the eggs was one that you told me a trick. Absolutely. So, during treatment is a time when, when many people have a hard time getting enough protein in. Our bodies need a little bit extra protein at that time. Right. But often, often uh, meats and things like that are the first things that people don't like. And right. we know those as a common source of protein. But yes, yeah, certainly having some hard boiled eggs on hand can, yeah. so you can pick one out of the fridge and have a little snack here and there. Um, and they're kind of a neutral taste and texture. Exactly. So I actually found this was the, this was my savior. It was in the for fridge sure. all the time, and it was easy to eat and easy to get down. So. And for those people who are really having trouble meeting their nutritional needs, they can mix that mix that hard boiled egg with a little mayonnaise and increase the calories per right. bite. So right. It's that point when every mouthful counts. We want to get every little bit of calories in that we can. Another good tip is to try some nuts and seeds or trail mix. It's again pretty neutral. Um, you can make mix your own. You can put more dried fruits, more nuts, but generally it's a concentrated source of energy and also a really good source of protein. Um, again, normally we would suggest that people have lower fat dairy products like skim and 1% milk and low fat cottage cheese, but again, if you're struggling to meet your nutritional needs, we do often make the switch to whole milk and encourage the right. intake of cheese and higher fat dairy products. Um, also, we'll use extra skim milk powder, which is just dried milk, right. to uh, fortify milk and other foods. And it bumps up the protein, It bumps right? up the protein, and it also bumps up the calories a little bit. One of the other things that you taught me during treatment was that to sit down to a big meal was daunting. So what do you recommend as opposed to you know, telling people to sit down for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Absolutely. So many people find that the more food that's presented to them, the less they actually want to eat. 
So we actually take the focus away from meal time and, and think about having small little meals and snacks through the day. I often recommend that people keep a little basket of snacks beside their, their chair that they usually yeah. sit in or, or that sort of thing. So if you see a little bit of something, you, you might be more apt to eat it. But again, having that little individual packet of trail mix or that one egg versus right. that big plate of food. And, right. and our family and friends are usually well-meaning and, and food is health to them. And so they often want to give us more food <laughs> right. when it's actually counterproductive. Right, but we know small amounts. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for these tips, Courtney. Absolutely. I think uh, everybody will appreciate them during treatment. Join us next time. We'll be back again. really had some valuable information for us. The tips about protein and adding that dried skim milk powder, they worked wonders for me. But you have to keep in mind that if you have specific dietary needs, especially during treatment, call the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency and you can get your own dietitian to give you tips that are helpful for your specific journey. That's Road to Relay for this week. Thanks to Scott Livingstone and Keith Carrison, as well as Courtney Mackay for their valuable information. We're back every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on Access 7, leading up to the Canadian Cancer Society's Relay for Life on June 8th at Douglas Park. Be sure to join us. Or watch for the replay of Road to Relay Sunday at 6 p.m. Or look for us on demand. Hit the On Demand button on your remote or go to Channel 200. Select Access 7, Health and Lifestyle, and then Road to Relay. Thanks for watching and bye for now.